Okay, we're recording. All right. Why do you think that, um, that man started to work in this way that is so labor-intensive and counterproductive? Well, I really, really appreciate that question because that was one that I had. When I saw how easy and simple this was, I, I says, God, where do we lose it? How, why are we doing this? And it was so interesting. He took me right back to Genesis in the beginning. And if you look at the, in, the, in the beginning when Adam and Eve were in the garden, they had this beautiful, relaxing day in the garden. And every afternoon and evening, God would come down and walk with them through the garden. And I'm sure as he walked through the garden, he would just share with them things that they saw in the garden that day about himself. Did you notice this? This is my character. This is all about me kind of thing. And I'm sure they just had this incredible time, totally relaxed, no stress, every day. But when man sinned, the scripture said things are going to change. And the wording is, by the sweat of your brow, you're going to raise food. Thistles and thorns and weeds are going to compete with you. And the next verse says, and man began to till the soil. You see, man never cultivated in the garden. He tended the garden, but he never disturbed the ground. And when man got disconnected from God, he began to till the soil. And if you ever look in nature, if you just observe what I'm talking about, it just shows you the power of the curse and how it is, how innate it is in us. Man comes to this beautiful place in nature where God has totally landscaped. Everything's growing great. And he says, so I'm going to tame this. I'm going to start growing things. So the first thing he does is either cut down all the trees, rips out all the grass, and starts cultivating. And what happens? Thistles and thorns, weeds that were never there before, start showing up. The ground gets compacted. It blows and washes away. And now this guy is killing himself labor intensively trying to maintain this thing not getting that you know before i showed up everything was growing great no one was working you know it just shows you just how incredible because it's not logical what what else do you feel like that you have kind of done to to kind of realize what different methods you should do in your garden well here's and i love the scripture you know jeremiah says call unto me and i will answer you and show you great and mighty things you don't know and then the verse in Proverbs, I think, is just so helpful. It says, trust in the Lord with your whole heart. And he helps us to remember where our heart is. It's not here. He says, and lean not on your own understanding. He says, do not try to figure it out. And in all of your ways, and what does all leave out? In all of your ways, acknowledge God, and he'll direct your paths. Very simply, God's saying, he says, listen, when you have issues, ask me. And, and trust me in your heart. Don't try to figure it out, and I'll show you what to do. When I come out here in the garden, I, I'll, you know, I'll have issues and stuff, and I'll just ask God. I'll just give you a neat example. One day we were, I was had a bunch of people over here, and the guy noticed my potatoes over here, and he says, well, how come you don't heal your potatoes? In a typical garden or farm where you have potatoes, because as potatoes grow, they expand, and they'll come to the surface, and when they surface, the light will hit them and turn them green and make them toxic. So the farmers have to keep healing up dirt to keep, keep them covered, you know? I looked at my potatoes, and I says, well, the first answer that comes to mind is I don't need to, but... I'm not sure why, so when I, I'll get, go in tonight and I'll ask my mentor and I'll get back with you. So I go in the house and says, now God, how come I don't have to heal my potatoes? And it was just so beautiful. It was like he took me underground and showed me a potato develop. He says, watch this potato because the ground below it's compacted and it can't move down. As it expands because dirt is heavy, it falls off the potato and the potato comes to the surface. And for that reason, they have to keep healing dirt over it to keep it covered. But in your wood chips, because they're light and they're totally intermeshed together, when the potato you know expands, the wood chips just lift. And I looked at this, and I love his responses. And remember, I told you I did this so I wouldn't have to show up to work. Healing potatoes is work. And I just started laughing. Yes, God, you're so awesome. Because this is my, you know my favorite line when people come here. I says, when you look at the landscape, this incredible, beautiful landscape on planet Earth, the size, the magnan, you know how magnanimous it is you realize that God designed this in such a way he would never have to show up to work. 
that really gets my attention because when I do a landscape, I become a slave. Now I have to fertilize, water, weed, mow, do all this work, and everything out in nature is way nicer than anything I do, and no one does anything. It's like, <laughs> it is so incredible. You know, God is just amazing. <laughs> what would you say to people that, um, you know, say, well, it worked for you because of, of your land and what was already there. Uh, can you want to turn that back other, on? Can, can this be done in yeah. other places? Yeah. You know, um, is it on? You know, the thing that I really appreciate, you know, I love God because he's just, he doesn't miss anything. He gave me, I have two properties that I'm doing this on. One, this one here, the ground is clay and rock. It would be impossible to farm. It would be considered from the agricultural point of view as marginal soil. The other place I have is 80% rock, totally gravel pit. You couldn't possibly till it. You couldn't possibly cultivate it. And in both of those places, I'm experiencing the most incredible, beautiful gardens. And what I love about God is that he is not challenged by anything. He is God. And clay and rock and rock do not concern him. He just has the capacity to turn it all around. And one thing I love about, I love that scripture where it says, as we behold the Lord, we're being changed from glory to glory. And I find that anything that comes in contact with God gets changed, including clay and rock and rock. And I love that. It's just such a beautiful illustration of who he is, you know. And I just, it's just so awesome to take people and, and, and take them back and show them my incredible ground. You can't even break with a pick and walk on this stuff. It's totally buoyant. Everything's just growing great, you know. And, and I didn't do anything. I just put the cover down and God does it all, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so people could do this if they lived it's, in it, like if, a if, you, if you live anywhere on the planet and it's not a desert, all you need to do is walk someplace where man's not messing with it and watch what God's doing because things are growing and copy it. It's that simple. And, 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 the, and, the, and <clears throat> it's, really, it's really basic. It's all about covering. You see, every living, every living organism has a protective covering. Human beings have skin. Animals have, have fur. Fish have scales. Birds have feathers. And the ground is a living organism. And everywhere in nature where man has not been, you see a covering, either grasses or needles and leaves. And the first thing man does when he shows up, he takes the cover off and thinks he can, he can do better. And it's incredible. It's just so devastating to the earth kind of thing. And, it's, and I have a tree over here growing in nothing but rocks. And it's thriving. Because you see rocks will put minerals off and off. Everything's breaking down, turning back to dirt. Minerals come off it, it holds moisture. I remember when I was a kid in Los Angeles, we'd go and go fishing on a hot summer day and the ground was just totally baked couldn't even, you know, hard as computer. You find a large rock, you roll it over, you found two things. It was damp underneath and there were worms. It says two things. One is the rock is retaining moisture and there's enough mineral coming, content coming off that rock to feed that worm. So whatever you have to cover the ground with, any organic material, and if you don't have any but rocks, it all works. It's all about covering. And if you get it covered, believe me, God will do the rest and you'll be blessed. <laughs> I was out there planting my seeds and I pushed this seed down. Something inside me says, give it a push. And I give it a push and it broke loose. And mm -hmm. simultaneously, there's this robin over here pulling worms out. And I hear inside, you know, I sent those worms to break up your hard pan. But you kept killing them with your tiller. Now you're not messing with it. They're breaking up your hard pan. And I just started crying. I thought, God. I mean, we don't realize how, how you know, the, the incredible genius of God in design and creation yeah. and how we're so disconnected, you know, mm -hmm. how we're just, oh, it's pathetic, you know, and we don't ask, we don't look. Everything out there, you know, is just demonstrating to us, you know, how easy this works. No one ever shows up to work out there, everything's growing great, right. you know, and here we do all this incredible intense labor and our soil blows and washes away. We're hauling out rocks, we're doing all this work, we fertilize, never again. I just said, Miracle Girl won't even approach that color green. Right. And there's nothing here, I don't do anything. This is just the natural process. You know, it's like, I love it. <laughs> you know, it's interesting that you even say that, because it's like, you know, in, the, in Genesis when, you know, God is, even approaches Cain, and it's about, you know, how hard it would be for him to work his land, because I think it all had to do with his heart. And then, the when his heart had turned uh, to the point where um, he had distanced himself from a relationship with the Lord, then all of a sudden it became work for him uh, to do what he was meant to do, which was uh, sow seeds into the into you know into the ground and produce a harvest. Can I share with you? It goes back back one generation before Cain, because when I saw how easy this was, I got in God's face and says, "Where did we lose it? This is so simple." What happened? He 
took me back to Genesis. You know, every afternoon and evening, I went out with Adam and Eve and walked them to the garden. And I was showing them things that they saw that day about who I am in creation. I was just revealing myself because all of nature disp you know, displays the handiwork of God. He says, after they sin, things change. And you read it. By the sweat of your brow, you're going to raise food. They didn't sweat in that garden. It was very laid back, very easy, because it was under the order of God. Right. And when they sinned, they got separated from God. And read the next verse after that. What does it say? And man began to till the soil. Cultivation is what brought the curse to the earth. And here's the word. It says, all of nature groans and travails, waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God. They know we got disconnected. And they groan and they travail because they know this is not how it's supposed to be. And they're waiting for the fulfillment of 1 John 3. Beloved, now we are sons of God. But it does not appear what we shall be, but we know when He appears, we shall be like Him. That's what nature's waiting for, for us to become like Jesus, to get connected with God and not be destroying the earth. And it just shows you how, how we got disconnected, how we just completely lost it. Because it makes no sense. When you look at the Midwest, like I said, they came here 200 years ago, 8 feet of top, 8 to 12 feet of topsoil. With cultivation, it's all blown and washed away. There isn't 8 inches. And you'd think, because we're logical beings, we'd say, this isn't working. But they're still doing it. And it shows you the power of the curse. Because, and here's the thing that I just, I mean, a man shows up into this beautiful, pristine place that God's got, got landscape. And he pulls up his, I'm going to tame this. I'm going to grow stuff. He cuts down all the trees, rips out all the sod. Right. And then the ground turns hard. It blows away. And he didn't realize, you know, before I showed up, everything was growing great. No one's working. And now I'm killing myself and losing it all. It's not logical. Right. It makes no sense. And it just shows you the power of the curse. It's heavy duty. It's awesome. <laughs> For speaking about Jesus coming back in the millennial reign. And it says that everyone will be under their own vine and under their own fig tree. He's putting us back in the garden because that's where we belong. We should have never left. Right. And it's more about more than just about food. It's about relationship. Because you, when, you're, when you're out in this stuff, you get connected. You see him bring the sun and the rain, things come up. When you give thanks for that food, it's not. It's different than when you bought it at Savory because you experience the provision of God. Mm -hmm. You saw him do it. It's different. you know. And I love it. Just, I just tell people, you know, I'm just getting gear for the next thousand years. This is, this is what I'll be doing the next thousand years. Just, you know, in a garden, so I'm just gearing up for that because that's what's coming up. You know? That's awesome. <laughs> that's awesome. What if I live in a really different climate than um, you live here in Squim? Is it just because you have perf perfect uh, climate conditions that you're able to grow like this? Well, that's a good question, and, and you want to keep it real simple. If you live in any place that's not a desert, just go out someplace where man's not messing with it, where there's something somewhat of an, in a natural state, and just observe how it's growing, and then copy it. It's really that easy. And if you and wherever something's growing, there's something you know organic. Some material is coming off of that thing that's growing that can be used to cover the ground. That's good. Could we go do that? Could we go look in your forest? Sure. Yeah. <laughs> We can just go out in the woods and see what ha what's happening here so you can get an idea. Rolling. Okay, we moved away from the woods 20 feet into an area that we've cleared everything. You can see this is still part of the woods. There's the roots here from the trees. But I want you to look at the soil. Look, look at what this stuff has become. You can't even, I mean, I would break this tool if I tried to break that up. Look at that. I mean, it's completely, in, you know, in all these rocks. This would be impossible to farm, to ever grow anything in. And I, as you look at this, I want you to realize everything you saw out there, all that orchard, all those gardens are growing on top of this material. And because of what it's growing in, this material poses no challenge, no threat to it. It's completely ignored. It's all underneath. And as time, as that stuff lays on top of this, this stuff eventually starts breaking up and changing. And I love so much the principle here because I, I think the beautiful verse in Scripture is it says, as we behold the Lord, we're being changed from glory to glory. And I'm finding that anything that comes in contact with God gets changed, including this nasty clay, clay and rock. Because I can take you out in the orchard there and, and move my hands with it. And even come to big rocks and stuff, but with my hands, I'm moving it. And you could never with your hands move, move this stuff. It's like concrete. And years, and I got places out there I probably have six, eight inches of stuff because I've been bringing such huge amounts. And I feel so blessed because I've really gained on time. 
And what I have there, I just feel like it's such an investment. This will be good for my kids, for my grandkids. I mean, this will go on for, you know, a long, long time. And it'll never turn back to hard pin that it was originally. So how long does it take um, in nature for um, a little bit of um, topsoil to form? In nature, it takes 100 years to build one inch of topsoil. And how long have um, you been doing it? What is your I've been here 31 years, and i got places out there I probably have, you know, um, six to eight inches of really nice work, stuff like this, and I feel so blessed, but I just brought in a lot of material, so I really tried to, you know, I gained, I gained time by bringing them out, and I feel so blessed because it's such an investment, and what I have out there will be good for the rest of my life, for my children's life, my grandchildren's life, and it's never going to turn back to hard pan again just because of, of what it is. That's great. So if I already have a garden that um, that I've already been growing things in, then um, how do I start with the wood chips versus if I don't? Okay, then in your garden, if you got weeds and stuff, just you know get rid of them, or if, it, if there's just a lot of them, just knock them down and cover it. See, the organic material, the weeds and the grass make good fertilizer, good organic material. So don't rip it out because it's beneficial. But if you cover it. And you know, you know, four to six inches, it'll all suffocate and die. Now, there's some some grasses that are more tenacious, such as quack grass. And I have a place in Squim over here that has that quack grass. But I put the which is a foot deep, and I was amazed. Nothing came through it. Totally suffocated it all, and it died. So it makes you know great great fertilizer. And like an orchard, if you got an orchard already in place, a bunch of trees with some grass grow on it, just cover that. Just leave all the grass right there. Just cover with the wood chips, you know. And and um, that grass will make good organic material and be feeding those trees. Um, would putting would putting newspaper down be a another? yeah if, you, if if you've got an if you got if you don't have enough, a lot of wood chips and you're afraid the grass would come through newspaper works the, the best because when newspaper gets wet it gets very very limp and just adheres to that surface and it will suffocate everything and the other thing about newspaper it has a very short life very soon it'll turn back to dirt and be gone so it doesn't last long if you use cardboard if you have some some not you know it's not a level place and you got some dips. That, that grass underneath there will have some air space and will, and will survive with the cardboards. But the, the grass, I mean, the um, newspaper is so ideal because it, when it gets wet, it gets so limp and just will suffocate that grass and it dies. So, um, and for, if I was going to use animal manure, um, for example, horse, um, is there anything that I should know specifically of what to look for? When you're using animal manures, you want to make sure that they're not eating grass hay. Or if they are, you're going to get an, a big lawn in your garden because the, the seed goes through the digestive system intact and will come out and sprout and grow. And the other thing about manures today, and this is so sad, is that you have to be really careful that you know where it came from because there's one company who raises chickens who, who openly says we feed our chickens arsenic. You know, I mean, arsenic's poison. You have to, and they do it to control parasites. And you have to ask, well, why are they controlling? Why do chickens have parasites? Well, because they're fed garbage. And so, unless you're, you know the source of your manure today, it would be very, um, you know, it could be dangerous, not good for you. What do they do? Okay, is it? You know, um, when you when you bring it home, depending on on the consistency, sometimes if it's really rough. Um, you you spread it out where where you're gonna where you're gonna plant, and if it's in the fall winter, it's ideal because you'll get all those winter rains that'll absorb in it and hold moisture and deposit all the compost tea into the soil. When you get ready to plant, you want to get your rake and pull the stuff away until you come into some pretty solid material because when the, when you first get it and it's very very porous, it's hard to get little seeds to grow in that because there's so much airspace. But you'll pull the wood chips away until you come down to something pretty solid, plant in it, and as the plants come up, you take your wood chips and you push back around your plants and you, you use it as a cover. And what you'll find each year as you do this, you'll have to rake less and less because it starts to break down and become very, very soft, malleable stuff like you see here. And that's the beauty of it, you know. So no matter what you have, you know, um, you just want to be able to have something pretty, pretty compact to be able to put start your seeds in. But once that happens, just push it back, and nature will very, very effectively break it down until eventually you can just plant right in it. Okay, um, today's August 12th. It's a nice, warm summer day, and if you look on around, if you just kind of photograph the area around here, you can see this has been, it's been pretty dry here this summer, and we don't have a you know a whole lot of water going on. This little space we're going to plant the garden in today is, uh, I had planted um, some peas in here last February and I harvested them in July. They were a wonderful crop of peas. And this is just sat here and just waited for me. 
get ready to plant today. And I want you to notice that we're not going to do any soil preparation. We're going to walk onto this and with this rake, make a nice little groove, and we're going to plant our seed. Put them, put them about, you know, uh, about two inches apart. One seed every two inch. See how I'm doing that? I'll just go ahead and do this one and do the next one. The next one we're going to do is spinach and we're going to do some lettuce too. Now lettuce, because they're really a fine seed, you know, um, it's really hard to get them just right. So I tend to overplant because it's very easy to come back and thin. And, and the thin plants my, my chickens really love and the seed's pretty cheap so it's not a problem. Just to put it all back. Good old rake. Only tool you use in this garden, or any garden for that matter. <laughs> yeah. Did you notice when those guys were here, how they're looking at all this? You know, the guys who make this are in total awe. You know, they're dumping this. They have no clue of the value. He's, uh, he's telling me, you know, his wife's got all these weeds and stuff at home and they can't grow stuff, you know. And I'm telling him, he says, look, everything you see here is just growing in your wood chips. Nothing else. <laughs> and it's like, you could just tell by looking at the expression in their face, they're in total awe of this, you know. <laughs> because it's just so beyond what our, our natural background and teaching is that we don't get it, you know. But it's so simple and so amazing. <laughs> Okay, I'm sorry, yeah, in that spin okay. this, this one right here is spinning. Okay. Isn't that fun? Yeah. <laughs> just, you know, and, and I say, well, next Thursday you're going to come by here with your camera and you're going to take a picture and it's going to be up. I mean, it's just so cool. You know?
got it for difference. That's it. Is that too many? No, it's fine. Okay. You know, like I say, whatever is too many is not a problem because we just pull them out and the chickens eat them, and it's all wonderful food for them. Uh -huh. And this is really not that expensive, so it's. You know, are they um, are they heirloom or are they just? Uh... These are all heirloom, yeah. Oh, okay, wow. And that black one is my. It's called Black Sea. The Simpson is. I, I I can't wait to get. It. It's this beautiful, huge green. It's just the most buttery, delicious lettuce on the planet. It's my wow. favorite. Man, I can't can't wait to watch these come up. Yeah, it's going to be cool. Like I can say, next Thursday, we'll be over here, and you'll see them coming out of the ground. It's so awesome. <laughs> Everything, or do some things? Just, no, just these two, the, the spinach and the, um, and the um, okay. lettuce, because the cilantro will take about a week and a half, two okay. weeks. It takes, it takes a long time for that to germinate. So not very long. Wow. And you see what's so neat about this garden? Is that you notice that Sarah's now walking on the row we just planted? Yeah, and if you throw a natural chelator, it takes heavy metals out of your body. It's one of those awesome things that I've thought of for this generation because we have those issues to deal with. And cilantro so nicely cleans that up for us. And you side, it really tastes great. Wonderful in salads, wonderful in salsas, delicious flavor. And then, after the cilantro is done, the green, you can let it mature and use the seeds as coriander, which is a great spice. So again, God's thought of all kinds of cool things with this plant. And it just doesn't, it's not just limited to fresh use. See how nice this stuff grades. It's just so cooperative and easy to work with. You're probably thinking, that guy's nuts. Nothing's gonna grow on that stuff. And it's just a bunch of dead dry sticks. He's crazy. What the heck is going to grow on that? But you're going to get to watch because in a week and a half that's going to be up and this next to us we're going to be doing um, some, some lettuce and spinach. They'll be up in a week. Okay. Um, so could you describe to us um, some of the nutrition information about um, the enzymes in apples? Yeah, apples, the, the enzymes that cause it to get ripe don't happen to seven, ten days before it's ripe. That's why when they fall to the ground green, they'll stay that way. But when they get ripe, they turn brown because the enzymes are present, turning it back to dirt, or if you're eating it, to digest it in your stomach. The enzymes are so important for our digestion in our bodies. And so today when you're going to the store and you're buying apples that were picked green, unripe, the enzymes aren't present. And so when you eat those, your body has to go somewhere else trying to get enzymes to break them down. So it actually puts a stress in your body instead of a nutritional benefit. And it's just, you know, it's so convenient here where these trees are so low to the ground and because the ground is so soft, I just let them fall. And again, it makes it so easy for harvesting. You don't have to do it all at once. It can be spread out because, see, not all apples in the trees ripen at the same time. Depending on their location, if there's more shade in one place or they're coming on later, they'll ripen different. And so it's just so, so nice to be able to pick them off the ground when they're ripe and all the enzymes are present. You get the full, the full um, amount of food value from them. And there's something that, you know, I've always thought of this is you look in nature, there's nothing eats unripe fruit except educated, sophisticated, affluent Americans. There's no insect, no bird, no untrained tribal person that lives very simple. They don't eat unripe fruit. They always wait till it's ripe. But the educated, affluent American, he goes to the store and buys dead unripe fruit on a daily basis and doesn't get it. Pretty interesting. <laughs> Great. Um, and something that you um, said in one of our um, clips also was the the genius of God um, in, in Genesis um, that he described how fruits and, and vegetables. Yeah, and I think that. it's I think it's so interesting as 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 you read in the first chapter there he's he's in the process of creating the whole universe and as he comes to the the, the, the hey, wait the, one second because it's October she's. Fine, doing a job, but <laughs> okay. it was, it was and then, noisy. And, yeah, and then say Genesis one two because okay. they won't hear her question. They'll just hear okay. you talking. Okay, in the first chapter of Genesis, where the the creation of the universe is being you know um, spelled out, 
I find it quite interesting in verse 29, and I love the way it, it opens it, and God said, this kind of gets your attention, he's, he's saying something here, he says, vegetables, fruits, seeds, and nuts, this is what I made for your food. You know, and it's really simple. This is not, you know, really difficult stuff. He says, it's there, and that's, and it's so interesting as you read, each one he says has its own seed. You know, we don't realize the incredible power that's in seeds. I just use an example. I don't know if you ever planted celery seed, but it's tiny. It's almost like dust. And in that little tiny seed, there's enough energy to push up a stem and two leaves before there's any root to take nutrients from the ground. That was all in that seed that you can hardly even see. It's so small. So what I'm saying is, and what God's saying is, there's an incredible amount of food value in seeds. They're really nutritious and good for us. The dead food versus living food, um, and how, why to get um, fresh and in season all year long okay. by planting. You know, there's a scientific fact that really is to me amazing. It's, um, it's in 10 minutes after fruits and vegetables are picked, they lose up to 80% of their metabolic properties. Think about that, in 10 minutes. And I use the example in my, in my garden, I'll pull a carrot out of the ground, and the whole air fills with the aroma. You can smell it everywhere. And the same with cilantro, I pass it, oh, this smells so good. Now when you go to the store and buy carrots and cilantro, there's no odor. So something's obviously not there that was originally. And I find it quite interesting how God is, has designed us to be eating food fresh in season. And so when you go to the store and you buy this food that's been shipped you know, 1,500, thousands of miles away from foreign countries. I mean, just do the math. There can't be much food value in it. You know, and here we're, you know, we wonder why we're sick reading all this dead food, to say nothing of the process, the canned stuff that's really dead, and we, and we wonder why we're not well. I mean, this is not, not hard to figure out, and it's just what I think is so sad is that God's made such an incredible provision for us. He's given us land, He's given us seed, He's given us, you know, the sun, the rain. It's so easy to grow food. And it's so natural. It's what everybody's always done from the beginning of time until the Industrial Revolution. So we need to get back to the original and do it right. Um, the first was the fungus and wood chips. How someone had, um, you know, made that remark. Oh, there's going to be fungus and wood chips. That's a negative. And if you could describe that, that's actually how it's actually a positive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, we got to be real careful how you know we look at funguses. You know, and this is the problem with the antibiotics. When they come into the body to take out a pathogen, they also take out all beneficial bacteria. There may be a bad bacteria there, but the beneficial ones are very important and necessary for our well-being. But when the antibiotic comes in, it kills everything. And so in nature, there are many beneficial bacteria and, and things that are breaking down soil, making, you know, turning the soil back to dirt, which are beneficial. And I always come to my witches and I all saw this all this all white mold and stuff and like, oh that's oh no, that's really rich stuff. And this is knows this thing is working. It's alive and it's breaking down and going back to soil. So we've got to be real careful how we look at these things that, you know, science has said is negative that it's really not. And again, when God designed this and created this, he wasn't learning. He did it from a place of all wisdom and all knowledge. He does it the best. And I'm not questioning it. It works. <laughs> That's awesome. What was the quote again? It's There's a God-shaped vacuum in every human being. Isn't that good? Yeah. A vacuum that's God-shaped that nothing else will fill. Nothing else will fill that vacuum. You know how a vacuum is just always sucking away from you, pulling you pulling you out, you know? And there's that in all of us. Is we want to know God. We want to know truth, you know? And you're always looking for it. And it's totally God-shaped. And until he fills that space, there's a vacuum. <laughs> yeah. Okay. The moon is out, so I yeah. guess it's uh, <laughs> the time to call it. That time it. Yeah, it's okay. Okay. Um, and I need to host anymore. I think we can.